Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another session of Gather to Grow here on Food for Mzanzi's Twitter Spaces. My name is Dawn Numdu. I'm your host for this evening. And tonight we're talking butternuts, how to produce them, what it looks like in Mzanzi, and just tips for farmers. We do these sessions once a week on this platform, and I invite experts to come in, talk about a specific crop, and this week, we talking butternuts. As we wait for more farmers to trickle in, I'm going to ask my guests just to tell me a little bit about themselves, where they farm, what got them into the agricultural industry, and where it all started for them in terms of their farming journey. My first guest, Lesha Lachai, has been with me on this platform before. Um, he is the founder of BK Agri Traders based in Polokwane. Hi, welcome again to Gather to Grow. It's great to have you with me. Oh, thanks again for having me. I'm looking forward to the show and then I think uh, we'll learn more from other speakers. Thank you so much. Now, the last time you were joining me, we were talking about a different crop. And I know that farmers are very dynamic in terms of their offering. So maybe um, you can just as a start, tell us a bit about your farming operation, what it is that you do and what you farm with besides butternuts. I'm still an emerging farmer. I think my products are well received by the community. Other than butternuts, I do watermelon and groundnut. I'm farming those kind of crops because currently I have water problems, so I depend on rainfall mostly. Hence, I do butternuts, watermelon, and groundnut because they doesn't require too much water. All right. Thanks so much for giving us that background and also telling us, you know, the other crops that you produce. My other guest is uh, Seho Arithe. He is the founder of Yama Jebitala. I hope I'm saying that right. You'll help me with the pronunciation. And he is also here to join us and talk about producing butternuts. But as a start, tell us about where you're based, what else you farm with, and what got you into the agricultural industry. Yes. I'm in Limbobo, whereby I'm an emerging farmer too. Uh, what got me into agriculture, it's all about passion, whereby there were some certain things I wanted to learn, some certain things which I didn't understand before I got in. So I was fascinated by how things have been done, why this comes from here. And so, yes, I'm in it, I'm an emerging farmer. Other crops which I, I do, spinach and cabbage, those are those which I, I But now, for this year, I have planted butter. Now. That's what I was doing. Thank you so much for joining me. I do have one more guest who might come through a bit later as the conversation goes on. Now, in Mzanzi, planting butternuts starts in August, where the temperatures, you know, have started to increase after winter. Do the farmers, you know, who's here tonight, our experts, agree that this is the best time to plant? And then also, what advice do you have specifically for new farmers? And why did you choose to plant with butternuts? I think the you mentioned it doesn't require that much water, so that's why you chose it. But maybe you can elaborate more on the timelines and the best planting time and the other reasons you know decided to plant this crop specifically. Firstly, butternut is not a huge requirement plant that needs so much thing to do. Yes, you can plant it butternut after August, but then due to climate changes nowadays, you can even shift your date to late November. Because last year I planted late November and then I harvested in late Feb to March. The challenges in planting during that time is because you're going to experience too much rain, of which butternut doesn't require too much water. You are just going to have a little bit of a problem. But other than that, August in Limpopo can still work. I don't know about other provinces because in provinces like your KZ10 and Pumalanga, actually they receive too much rain throughout the year. So when you're planting butternut, you don't want to have your area waterlogged because too much moisture on the soil is too many diseases. From my side, planting not necessarily late August, but then in September works very well. Choosing the plant is so easy because it doesn't require too much work. You don't have to apply to too many fertilizers to eat. You don't have to apply so much pesticides to eat. You just have to eat your, your plants and then you will succeed. And then other than that, one thing I can add to that is that 
you need to avoid planting during frosty seasons because the plants are going to to succumb to diseases such as mildew and then you don't want to to be in that situation. Thank you so much for that context. Sekho Aritle, do you agree that planting later is better, keeping in account the issues that a lot of farmers have in terms of climate change? What does it look like in your region and what made it attractive to you as a crop to grow as a farmer? I do agree with it that those months have been said there by my fellow farmer. But then again, it all depends on the budget. If you are in a place whereby there is rain, you can still use tunnels. You can plant them in tunnels and all those so that the rain can be out. You can try it in tunnels because the frost will be outside. But if you're an emerging farmer like us, with a tight budget, I believe you have to do it in summer season. Whereby I planted it early Feb, then I harvested it early May. So I wanted to see if it will work. Because the content which we got is they plant this to this. But then again, if you can check the season, in February it is still summer. Meaning that it can still accommodate just like in August, in, in September, November and all other, other months. So avoid going to winters and swell if you don't have tunnels. We spoke about other diseases. It's true. You have to make sure that the land is not too much wet because you might get black rot. Well, that disease is on the butternut whereby if the, the soil is too much wet, they can break again if there's too much wood. So you just have to irrigate the way you have to. The tree has to get 1.5 liters per day for wood. So in that way, and again, it's true that it doesn't require more wood. So if it's, it's 1.5 liters, it means that... And, a drip irrigation, let's say you're using drip irrigation, they say in an hour it's, it's two liters. Less than an hour you can you can do for a day. So it, it's much cost effective. It's much cheaper if you can just control all those things. Thanks so much for that. Now let's get into the basics for anyone, you know, interested in growing this crop. What should farmers kind of understand from day one? And you have given us a lot of background in terms of the climate. But let's talk about soil preparation. What kind of soil does this crop like? What is advisable? I know a lot of farmers will say, test your soil, test your soil. Is it important to do that with butternuts as well? And what is the best or ideal and what has your experience been so far? Nishalakai, let's start with you. Just to unmute your mic. I'll start by saying for every crop or for every plant that you need to plant, you need to know the type of soil you're working with. Testing the soil is good for your knowledge and then for crop specifications and then even for crop capabilities. So you know the kind of soil you are dealing with, the capability of the soil to sustain certain crops. In terms of butternut, you will be looking at a well-drained soil. It's more like a loamy to sandy soil. That's a well-drained soil, whereby the soil doesn't get saturated easily with water. There's ease of penetrations for roots. There's ease of infiltration, filtration of water. More specifically here, when you're doing your soil test, you'll be looking at your pH because the butternuts thrive well in a pH of 6.0 to, to 6.5, which is more likely a neutral pH. That's the kind of soil you'll be looking at. This helps in because the butternut root stretches a lot and then this will help you in terms of the roots in reaching for the water beneath the ground and the roots in reaching for nutrients beneath the ground. I think loom to sandy soil is the ideal one for emerging farmers or for anyone who would like to go into butternut production. Thanks so much. I want to talk about seeds versus seedlings. What's your advice? And when farmers grow from seeds, what is the best way to plant it? Because I understand that it can either be done by hand or by mechanical planters. What has your experience been like? And what should farmers be aware of? Would you like to take this one? And then unless you can also add on. Between the seedlings and the seeds, for emerging farmers, I believe we are speaking for emerging farmers. I think actually the seedlings are better because with, with seeds, if I, let's say you have different people to, to plant, this you said can be done by hands. So someone will be very down there and it will take time to emerge to the ground or it can be even, uh, it can even die down there. But with seedlings, you can count your plants and you know that it's already out there. 
What you have to, to look again, you must make sure that control the cutworm, even though I haven't experienced it uh, for my side in particular. So I think seedlings, seedlings are the most, the best for emerging farmers. I mean, if you are doing 20 hectares, I believe seeds will be much effective than seedlings because there you will be using a tract unless you have the machine, as you said, uh, the machine of seedlings plant. So for emerging farmers, my advice is that let's use seedlings they are more effective. They won't let you down. Because they are already there. There are trees, little trees you can see there. Yeah, I believe about seedlings. I used seedlings and seeds. So the seedlings did much better than the seeds. When I, when I planted butternut, because I wanted to see which one works more effective. But the seedlings won the race. Thanks. I think most farmers opt for seedlings. But what happens if you are planting with seeds? Are there specific specifications in terms of, you know, how far apart? And what happens if you have sort of excess seedlings? What do you do with that? Because I know that sometimes few will come in the tray, splitting it, kind of being aware of those issues. And then you mentioned that there is pests that that should be aware of at this stage. What should farmers be looking out for? Lashalakai, would you like to take that one? I still agree with my fellow farmer there in terms of using seedlings. Remember, seedlings need too much care, especially when you're transplanting. When you're having excess, you need to transplant. That means separate the seeds. You need to be wary of not damaging the roots because when the roots are damaged, obviously your seedlings are not going to grow. In terms of the seeds, I'll go back. As imaging farmers, remember we are, we are talking of people who are not good in terms of capital. So when they've, they've bought seeds and then they're planting uh, it takes a lot to emerge, like my fellow farmer has said. And then that breaks the courage for farmers. When, whenever you're not seeing your plants emerging, you, you kind of lose hope because more especially in terms of butternuts, because it takes so many days to, we are talking about almost two weeks for them to emerge. And then it can be longer when your, your depth is long. That doesn't bring courage to farmers. That's why we advise them to get seedlings based on their pockets. Another advantage of seedlings is because they are treated. Like, of course, your roots are not damaged or they are not lodged. Then you are sure that the the plants will survive, unlike in terms of your seeds, which might not emerge. I think my, my, my fellow farmer can add on that. Thanks so much for that. Let's talk about the growing period. Is it normally between 12 to 15 weeks from a seed or seedlings? And then could you maybe just add on when it will actually be ready to harvest? And then some of the, you know, things that this crop would require monitoring from the point of your seedlings in the ground, what should you be looking out for? Sehori Lekle, would you like to take this one? Coming to that point, it's more effective on that. And again, looking at the seedlings and seeds, for seedlings, they are already out there. You can count three months to four months. It's fine with them. But with seeds, mind you, some will emerge faster than others. So you won't have uh, the same time period whereby you can say, okay, this is three months for these ones and three months. Mind you, they are just on the field. But with seedlings, you know very well that, okay, today I've transplanted. On the 1st of Feb, you know very well, okay, today I've transplanted. Then you know from that you can count, okay, three months to four months, everything will be fine because they're already out there. But with seeds, it's very difficult for a farmer to keep track because others will emerge today, others will emerge after two days, others will emerge after three days. So it means that even growing, their fruits won't be the same. So in that sense, there won't be a very good time relationship. That's why I always go with seedlings. They're already out there looking at the time you can start counting your months, three months to four, then okay. Now you know, you are sure of that because there are already little plants there. Unlike the one whereby the other one at the far end will emerge today, even others will come after two weeks. Depends if they will come out or how deep they have been buried. See, that's, that's the challenge with the seed, to, to keep record of the months. But with seedlings, it's much simpler because you know, okay, I've planted this. If you know after two weeks, you have planted this portion, after two weeks, you have planted this portion. That again, you know, okay, this will be ready at these two weeks. After these two weeks, this will be ready because there are already plants you can see there. But these seedlings, imagine there and there with different time frames. Actually, it's difficult to keep track. 
because I've done it. Thanks so much. And then what are some of the things that you should be looking out for? I think you guys spoke about cutworm. What are some of other pests that you should be looking out, especially when it comes to when you're just planting your seedlings? And then I'd maybe also like to talk about the best way to irrigate. I think Lashalakha, you spoke about this crop not needing that much water, but how much water does it actually require? Other pests that you will encounter in butternuts, you're talking of the street cucumber bacon. It's one of those pests that is there throughout the growing season of the butternut. So it's one of those that you need to deal with decisively. I wouldn't gel much on most of the diseases because there are too many, but then I'll go for those that have an contact. You'll have your squash bug. It's a small bug and it's grayish in color, which shows a marked preference for pumpkins. It slowly emerges in spring, usually about the time your fruits are becoming to show up. You can talk about diseases already I've mentioned, mildew, but then more visibly you will see your, your polder mildew. Your polder mildew is the one which is uh, whitish in color. It's more like powder. In most plants, we know that it's as a result of too much water or too much moisture. And then again, one of the viruses that I've encountered it's a mosaic virus, the one that leaves the leaves to be folded downwards and distorted. It's a virus and then you get your fosarium, your fosarium and your, your fruit rods. Those are the kind of diseases, viruses that you will encounter a lot. And then again, you mentioned this question has two portions. I don't remember the second one I wanted to answer. Can you please remind me of it? Just around irrigation. What is your advice and what type of irrigation do you use when it comes to butternuts? Mostly in every crop, the advice is to use drip irrigation because it saves water and then you are avoiding waterlogged areas because more especially in butternuts where your foods become in contact with the soil. If the soil is waterlogged, then obviously the foods will be prone to diseases and pests and things like your powdery mildew. It's advisable to use your drip irrigation, but then you can still use your spring grass and in commercial or in a larger scale farm, you can use your pipe center pivot system, but then you need to time your irrigation. For instance, if it's in summer, you need to irrigate before the sun comes so that excess water will evaporate during the day. So that's why you eliminate, you kind of eliminate your water locking areas. If you are, you are using drip, you are avoiding such uh, encounters and then you will know exactly the amount of water that will be feeding to the crop, which requires less than or between one and a half to two liters a day. Thanks so much. So, do you also agree that this is the best way to go about it? And what have you experienced on your farm? I do agree with him. As well as I said, being a maximum farmer, we have to look for some certain elements. Coming to irrigating system, drip irrigation is the best. In 12 years, you can limit. Like I said earlier on, they will tell you that, okay, this drip irrigation in an hour can, can drip around two liters. So you know very well, okay, since well, this crop requires two liters. After an hour, you can switch off your, your thing. But with spring last, I would advise that because even if you have put your fungicide, it means that when you are going to irrigate, you are going to remove it. But with the irrigation, if you, you can put it there, it will, it will still, there, still be there. And again, to control the wetness, the water lock indeed, because if there is too much water access on the soil, and the butternut has been there for a while, it will experience the black rod, whereby it turns the butternut into, into brown, not the color which we know. Let me put it that way. So less required water on the ground means that you won't experience those kind of things because they will cost you. If you put more water, uh, you increase the cost. There's no way that you can say, okay, let me put three liters or, or four liters then meaning that when they grow again, they'll have too much water and they'll break again. So you'll be losing. You just have to do as they said. So the things which I've encountered due to rain, I had too much water access. So the butternuts were, were there for a very long time in the wetness. So the black rod was there, but I could overcome it. The mildew again, I experienced it. So even again, I did overcome those challenges. Uh, with the help of those who have more experience than I. Because I'm that kind of person, if I don't know something, I, I call someone. See, I experience this 
how can we help each other? Those are the things which I encountered, the mild view and the black rod. And again, I still go with the drip irrigation, whereby in the drip irrigation, there is drip tape and drip pipe. So for us, imagine farmers, the drip tape, it's, it's, much, it's much less and much effective. Because either way, along the line, the drip will block after a while, then you'll have to throw it away. And if it's a drip tape, because 500 meters of the drip tape is around 1.6. 200 meters of drip pipe is around 2,100. You can see the difference. So the drip, I would advise for the drip tape. That's what I'm saying. It's much effective. Thanks so much. Um, I think you guys have really highlighted some of the challenges that you've experienced. And that's really important because so often farmers might not know what to expect, but you've really given us a very clear indication of some of the challenges that you've experienced and maybe some of the, you know, ways to go about it and not experience it as new farmers. Let's talk about, you know, how long does it take for butternuts to grow? And also I want to maybe get into some of the tips in terms of the harvesting process. How long does it take depending on how big your field is and the crops that you have to harvest? Is it very labor intensive? What should you be thinking about? And some of the tools that you need to use to harvest if you're doing it manually. Tashila Khai, can I start with you? In terms of the growth period, we are talking about between 110 to 120 days, which is about three months. So in terms of the equipment that you need, imagine farmers don't have equipment. They only use a tractor and a mild pot plow or a disc plow. So after plowing, when you're going to, to sow in your seeds or your, your seedlings manually, what you need to do is just have to, more especially, your forks. And then some of us, there's this hand tool, that hand plant tool for seedlings that some of imaging farmers uses. Then you check your spaces, of which uh, when you are depending on rain, you need to allow your plant space so they are not going to compete too much for water nutrients, whereby you are going to your spaces in between row of 45 centimeters to 50, and then apart uh, rows of uh, 1.5 to 2 meters. But then if you have water, you are irrigating your crops or you are experiencing too much rainfall, you can do your 40 centimeters in between and then one meter apart. So from there, you will be counting your days. If it's cyclings, then the growing period will be reduced from 120 to less because you don't know how much days or when you buy cyclings, how many days they have been there. But then if you are using seeds, you are still going to go for almost 120 days. Then from there, you are going to need your hand hose for weeding because there's too much importance to weed your plants because in a butternut field, you experience too much which if you don't control them, they're going to compete with your plants and even shade your plants and then restrict them for growing. Then you will be monitoring your plants up until they start fruiting and then you'll be sprouting your, your diseases and whatsoever. And in terms of other things, for us, imagine, imagine farmers, we use scissors and then knives to just to cut the butternuts and then we, we leave a little bit of the roots there so that it doesn't wilt. And then we then store them in a place whereby the temperature is more like regulated to around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. And then even the ventilation is well. Thanks so much. And then is it very labor intensive? Like if you're out in the field, how many hours would you need to be putting in to be able to harvest? And also maybe some tips in terms of harvesting. So what was your experience? Coming to labor, well, it all depends on, on, on how you run the farm. I mean, with me, I'm half a head. We were plus or minus three or four, sometimes four, let me say three, sometimes four. It will depend on how much order we got. Because as an imaging farmer, you might not have a facility to take them from the ground and store them somewhere. Like he said, that the temperature has to be regulated. You find that you've got a little shake there, well, but the temperature cannot be regulated. So for me, coming to, to labor, it wasn't that hard or that difficult. Well, we enjoyed it. We are about 
three, sometimes we are both four. And in a day, we can do plus or minus 210 kgs. So we, we, we did not push ourselves to that much. We go by the order. Let's say they want the order of 50. We will go there, harvest for fifth, then we will wait. That's how we did it. Because harvesting it and putting it in one place, you will have another problem of head. They will help you to harvest too. As you put them there, come and feed on those. And that's costly because even the sex, they get torn out by the rats. But then again, if it's in the field, I haven't experienced it whereby a rat went to the field and fed on, on a button. But as you put them together on one place, they, they gather there and do their best way, taking you back. So coming to harvesting, uh, maybe it's because it was in the little portion, but it was fun. It wasn't that labor intensive. It wasn't that hard. The advice is that if, if it's not that big at all, and you know that you don't have a good space or a place where you can harvest and put them there, just let them stay at the farm, at the field for, for a little while. Because putting them where the rats can, can reach them, you will be going back again. They, they will take you back. Because I've experienced that. That's where I came with the solution. Okay, I've harvested in the field. I've never came across a button eaten by a rat. Why must I put them there? But then it was a good decision that I did. But if you do have a storeroom, you can harvest, pack them, put them there, and they'll be they're ready to be taken away by the others. So I think it must be that. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, that definitely is a challenge for lots of farmers. Ashley Khai, would you like to add something to that point? In terms of harvesting, yes. The reason we harvest and store somewhere is because during our harvest season, it was still rain. If it's still a rainy season, the fruits will still be fed water and nutrients from the plants. So they will start to burst because of too much water and, and, and nutrients. Hence, we decided to harvest and then store somewhere to avoid busting of the fruit. Thank you, man. Thanks so much. Now, let's talk about markets. What does the market look like for the specific crop? If you go into any store, it's always available. People, you know, consume it regularly in South Africa. It's a crop that's familiar to us. What does the market look like? And then maybe, Sekhulita, I want to maybe ask about what you did specifically in terms of agro-processing and the opportunities in that space for butternuts. But I'm going to start with Lesh just to tell us about which markets he established and what it looks like for him. Like I always tell people that before you plant, you need to look for the markets. Like where are you going to sell your products? When I reached my harvest time, it was so easy for me because I get I, I had too much demands. There were people gardening for the produce. So... It's easy for emerging farmers to get into the market currently because butternuts form part of the feeding scheme of the children. So you'll get your nearby schools, which needs too much butternut. But then for me, I've learned that as an emerging farmer, for you to make something out of your crop, you got to do your street market. The street market is the one that gives us reasonable returns because when you're going for your your supermarkets and hypermarkets and then your agencies, they will rip you off. Although they need, the demand for them is too much, but then you are going to negotiate for your crops of which at the end you are going to lose. If you are an emerging farmer, it's, it's still fine to sell almost 100 bags a week because you'll be making money as compared to people who will be selling 250 to 300 units daily. Because those units will be taken for half of the price that will be selling your produce. Thank you so much. So, Horikli, now I understand that, you know, initially that you had some trouble marketing your crop and you actually opted to do something different in terms of agro-processing. Do you want to share a bit about your creativity in terms of that? Coming to, to, to the market, some of, of the butternut due to, to some, some diseases. They were not, the skin outside was not uh, looking good, but the inner part was still healthy and all those due to, to control of, of whatsoever, uh, whatso- whatsoever fungus I experienced. So I just came with, with the method about why not cut and dice it? Why not remove the skin? It's only the skin. So I cut and dice. Well, I, I got 
the response which I did not, which I wasn't hoping for, because I was just saying, let me do trial and error. Only to find out there is a much demand on them. The conversation which I had with my customers were like, it's not like we don't like butter. But then again, this peeling thing, it's something else. But if it's in one kg, pearl and rice, I can just buy, put it in the refrigerator, cook half, then tomorrow cook half again. So, yeah, it was something which I was just trying, but then I got a great response on that. So coming to, to, to the other 10 kgs and all, my fellow farmer is, is telling the truth about this, this, this supermarket. You'll be selling for this going the day, uh, they'll be negotiating with you. But for the locals uh, along the street, and all, you make good money. You make good money on that. So I would advise to have both ways. If you've got a market in the supermarket, it's still fine. But then again, have the one for the locals. Have someone at the tech center. Have someone at the shopping complex. Do those kinds of things. Because that's what I did. I had two, two people at the shopping complex, whereas others were supplying the, the, the supermarket. So indeed, it's half of the price of what they, of what you make on this. So, I mean, they'll be saying, okay, we take by bulk, uh, give us by this amount, and and, and all those. So, but then again, the availability of the market and the pricing depends on the demands and on, on, on the season at which it's available. I mean, if we can look at the numbers around, let's just start for this year around January. February, March, from the farm, from, let me say, from uh, from the market, Pretoria. It was around 35 friends and all those. But if we can look now, I mean, we are from winter, people did not plan due to, due to, to frost and all. It's around 75 friends. So you can see it has doubled. So it, it all again, it, it again depends on when you sell it. If it's about this time and you have it, you can sell it to them. To the, to the supermarket, they will give you 75 rand per day, because that's what is there. At least if they can negotiate, they can go to 70 rand. But mind you, in, in January, they will took it around 35 rand. So I believe this time, it might be the best time to give the supermarkets to because they take in large numbers. But from December, January, November, December, January, February, in this summertime, I, I will go with my fellow farmer there. You can sell it around 50, 60. It will depend again. At your area, the availability of, of your product. Thanks so much. And I'm sure that there are actually other avenues also. I'm just thinking about puree in terms of baby food. Um, that's also something that Thomas might consider. And I think it was really amazing that you kind of looked at what are the alternatives to still be able to sell your produce despite the setback that you were having. So hats off to you for that. Maybe, Les, you can just talk about, also, I think it might have a bit of a longer storing period. If you don't have a market yet, or maybe waiting for better prices, do you agree that this is something that farmers can also do? What are some of your other final tips that you can share with farmers if there's no one else that'd like to contribute? Definitely true that you can store the, the produce for a longer time. In my case, I think some of the projects were stored for almost six weeks. And then I wanted to hear the response of the customers after purchasing those that were stored for six weeks. And then they didn't complain. That means uh, the produce can stay longer as long as good ventilation is maintained and then uh, in a cool place. And that's what will work for emerging farmers because we don't have storages or bigger enough storages. And sometimes you just want to remove your your produce from the farm to avoid things like criminals because some of these uh, crops, people jump their fences to try and steal them. So when you have harvested them in a way, they can be stored for six weeks. And it's so easy, even if someone needs them urgently, when you have harvested them and stored them, if there's an agent buyer, you can be able to sort him or her hair out. Thanks so much. And then do you have any final tips for farmers when it comes to harvesting this crop? And as part of our next round, I'm actually going to maybe ask farmers to give their favorite recipe. When it comes to the crop, maybe you can, you know, this is just the question that I'm springing on you. But how do you best like to prepare your butternuts? <laughs> I'm not the best cook, eh? I prepare. <laughs> I, I still prefer the, the old way, just uh, small water to boil it. 
for your advice, the, the cultivar that I've planted, I forgot to mention it, it's Waltham, the one that I got at NTK. It's so sweet, so when you're, you're, you're cooking that one, you don't even need to add sugar on it. So I think it's best for, for consumers to get that one. Thank you. I also forgot to mention the cultivar, so thank you so much for sharing that. And I think you're like me, the simpler the better, but I do know that people like roasting it in the oven as well, and that's really yummy as well. And you can even put it in the fire. Anyway, I'm getting excited about cooking. So, what would you advise, you know, just as final tips, and then how best do you like to enjoy your butternuts for someone who's growing it and consuming it? Coming to, to cooking, I think me and my fellow farmer, the only thing which we can be our best at is planting. <laughs> uh, so, coming to cooking, I'd prefer someone to cook it for me because I know that uh, I'm not good at cooking a butternut. I might be uh, producing it, but cooking it, I'm not good at it. So, and the advice which I can give, always know that uh, being a farmer, you are a learner. It's, it's a learning curve. Practice makes better. And again, make sure that you, you form relationships. Make sure that you have relationships with the guys at whereby at the fungicide, at the chemicals, even at, at, at fertilizers. Make sure that you have that those people at your fingertip. Whenever you encounter something and you build a relationship whereby you can just call and send the picture and they'll tell you what to do. Because I realize that being the best farmer is not knowing everything. It's about the contact you have. Because you, you might experience something which your mentor has never experienced. But if you contact the guys at the chemical shops, they are always at the field at the big farms and all those. They, they can help you. Don't just go to a shop and, and purchase a medication or a fertilizer and live without making a relationship. Make a relationship with those people then you will succeed. It's much simpler than that. Unlike traveling 25, uh, let's say 60 kilometers to a shop and find that the medication we are looking for is not there. At least you can call while you are still at the farm. Hey, we have this kind of medication. Or I experienced this kind of, of disease. Do we have the medication? He said, no, use this and that, but we don't have it. Try somewhere else. You see, now it's, it's cost effective again. So yeah, let's go and play with the soil. I know most of us, when we grew up, they were saying we must not play with this way. Now let's play with this way. It's about time they won't say anything about that. They, they will encourage you to play with this way. So yeah, that's, that's what I can say. Let's make a great relationship, communications, then that will make you a great farm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think as kids, you're not encouraged to do that. But just as a, a comment, a side note, my son... Whenever I ask him what he wants to be, he now says he wants to be a farmer. So I'm very happy about that. Thank you so much for joining me, my speakers. It's really amazing to, you know, just share knowledge. And I hope that everyone on this space enjoyed it. We'll be back again next week. Remember, if you missed any part of this conversation, it will be available on Food from Zanzi's YouTube channel. That's foodfromzanzi.co.za. And then, of course, guys, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you before, but I do host a weekly farmers podcast um, that's available on all your podcast platforms. And on the podcast, I talk about different commodities. We unpack different topics also within the agricultural industry. So if you're keen to learn more about what other farmers are doing and what some of the amazing stories there are out there of farmers, do listen to that that's on spotify google podcast all of your podcast platforms that's farmers inside track as well so thank you so much until next week have a lovely evening and like um, my speaker said let's go and enjoy our time in the soil so have a great evening stay warm <laughs>